last class we basically discussed about operations on complex numbers in fact i talked about uh, representation of complex numbers point form polar form euler's form and we also do, did uh, basic operations like comparison addition subtraction multiplication division we talked about conjugate we talked about uh, square rooting we talked about logarithm okay so in all these operations there is one operation which is left off which is raising any power any power of integer or a rational number on an integer on a, a complex number so we are going to start with that uh, concept and that concept is called as the de moivre's theorem d d moivre's let me just d moivre's theorem was this theorem taken up in school when you did complex numbers did you come across de moivre's theorem the pronunciation is moivre it's a french word okay so in this we are going to learn how to raise a complex number moha <laughs> right i actually remember it by that name only <laughs> so i'm telling you my inside method to remember this name so it's de moivre <laughs> so let's say you have a complex number which is given by r cis theta so i have chosen a polar form and if i'm raising it to the power of n okay if i raise it to the power of n what happens okay now please do not restrict yourself to thinking that n could only be natural numbers right n could be negative integers also n could be a rational number of p by q form as well so i'm going to divide this theory uh into two parts one is where i'm going to talk about case number 1 where your n happens to be an integer okay where your n is an integer and case 2 is where i'll be talking about n being a rational number of the nature p by q okay now for an integer uh the concept is pretty simple if you have a complex number z which is raised to the power of an integer then what happens then what happens you raise the modulus to the same integral power okay and you multiply the argument by that integer so as you can see here r is raised to the power of n and the argument has been multiplied with n right now this is very evident actually because uh, if you look at the euler's form notation you can easily understand how this or why this works actually so if you write the thing in euler form r e to the power i theta and raise it to the power n it is as good as r to the power n e to the power i n theta so now this becomes your new modulus and this becomes a new argument so after raising it to a power of n your modulus gets raised to the same power of n whereas the argument gets multiplied to that n okay a uh, simple example i can cite here let's say i have uh, i have a complex number i'll just take a simple uh, case 2 cis pi by 6 okay 2 cis pi by 6 and somebody says uh, i want to raise this complex number to the power of 5 okay so what should be the result so simple as per de moivre's theorem you don't have to sit and multiply them to the power uh, multiply them five times or apply any kind of a binomial expansion de moivre's theorem basically makes your life uh, pretty easy so z to the power 5 will be 2 to the power 5 into cos 5 pi by 6 plus i sin 5 pi by 6 of course uh, you can further simplify it okay and you if you want to convert it to point form you can always do that but i'm not interested in simplifying it to any point form just wanted to demonstrate how this particular thing works okay so remember when you raise a complex number to the power of n okay this gives you only one answer and this is the answer so you get only one answer only one answer out of it okay only one answer why i am saying this are you yeah only one answer why i am saying this is because when i take n as a fraction maybe a rational number i will get multiple answers from there we will talk about it when the right time comes okay as of now let us understand this first okay so please note down people who have joined in late first of all good afternoon and uh, 
we were doing operations on complex numbers where i am basically talking about or discussing how to raise a power on a complex number which is a rational number but rational number basically i have first taken it as integer first and for integer basically the rule works like this the modulus gets raised to the same integer power and the argument gets multiplied to that integer okay i give one demonstration for the same okay the few points to be noted here please note down the following points number 1 if your complex number is given to you like this r cos theta plus i sin phi okay where theta and phi are not equal to each other okay and somebody says hey i want to raise this power i want to raise this complex number to a integer power n okay please note this down you cannot write it like this that means the de moivre's theorem is not going to work on this okay please note this is z to the power n will not be equal to r to the power n cos n theta plus i sin n phi because primarily this is not the polar form for it as i already told you in polar form theta and phi are equal to each other so this is not the polar form hence this result will not come out now in many competitive exams they will like they will try to deceive you they will try to deceive you with a similar looking expression to that of a polar form and they will ask you that if i raise this to the power of n which of the following options can you know occur and basically one of the options will be this so please do not mark it please do not mark it this is not going to work out okay <coughs> second imposter which you should be uh, aware of if i write my complex number in a slightly fancy way let's say sin theta plus i cos theta okay and i want to raise z to the integer power n then also this is not going to be r to the power n sin n theta plus i cos n theta so please note these two are not going to work out okay so be aware be careful i'm just you know giving you some kind of imposters imposters means they will try to deceive you but don't get deceived but don't get deceived <laughs> so this was uh, the story related to the first part of de moivre's theorem when our, our power was an integer now integer could be both positive or negative so don't be under the impression that sir is saying integer means he, he means natural number no the same rule could be applied even for a negative integer also okay the second rule is tr uh, slightly tricky and lengthy which i will be now giving in some time but if you want to note down anything from this page please do so please do so could you scroll up uh, okay say to has a sir power zero will become one in this case also right? yeah yeah power zero will become one in this case also uh, where you want me to stop uh, manu do you want me to scroll all the way to the first uh, line that i wrote or somewhere in between i mean is this position okay okay fine done oh, okay thank you now we'll be uh, moving towards the second case where your n is not an integer rather rather n is a rational number okay that is n is of the form p by q where p and q are integers where p and q are integers okay now i will not be going into the proof of this uh, i'll be directly stating the result because proof is not going to be required in any form or shape neither in je main nor in je advance okay maybe when you do complex number analysis in your undergraduate there the proof might be you know uh, stated to you so de moivre theorem gives a very very important interesting uh, you know rule for finding out a power of p by q raised to a complex number so let's say i write the complex number as r sin theta 
Okay, and I want to raise this complex number to the power of p by q. Okay, so basically this is what I am interested in doing. Okay, now let us try to understand this expression slightly more deeply. When you raise a number to the power of p by q, let's see this in phases. It is as good as first you are raising it to the power of p. Okay, and by the way, uh, when I write this, p by q is in the simplest form. P by Q has been expressed in the simplest form. Expressed in the simplest form. Simplest form means they cannot be further scope of cancelling out anything. Okay. P by Q has been expressed in their simplest form. Okay. Now raising it to the power of P by Q, I'm just carrying out this operation in two phases. One is I'm raising it to the power of P, and then I'm raising this whole thing to the power of one by Q. Okay. Now P being an integer. If you see the inside part, will follow the De Moivre's theorem, which we had discussed in case one, where our power was integer. So that will become r to the power p cos p theta plus i sine p theta. Okay. I think nobody has any doubt or concerns till this stage because this is very much what we did in the previous slide. Um, okay. Is it fine? Any questions here? Okay. Now. Now understand this. When you are raising a number to the power of one by q, you are actually finding the qth roots, just like square roots. When you are when you are raising it to the power of half, you are finding its square roots. In square roots part, we, which we did in the last class, we got two answers, isn't it? Two square roots. Now apply the same logic here and tell me how many answers will come out if I do this to the power of one by q. That means I'm finding q at roots. Then how many answers will come from it? Q answers will come right. So we will end up getting q answers from it. In the previous De Moivre's theorem form, where we are, where power was just an integer, we only got one answer, right? R to the power n cos n theta plus i sine n theta, or R to the power n cis n theta. But unlike the previous case, here I will get q different answers, right? So basically, the denominator of your power. That many number of roots I will get. Are you getting my point? Or that many number of answers I will get. So how do you find these Q answers? So for that, De Moivre gave a very interesting uh, mechanism. He said that he said that raise this raise this r to the power p to the power of one by Q. Of course, when you, when you are doing it, keep it as real. Okay, so this term will be completely real. So what is the whatever is the real answer that comes out from it? That answer you have to keep over here because ultimately this is going to play the role of the modulus. Modulus is a real quantity because it signifies the distance of that complex number from the origin, right? And then he said, and then he said, write this p theta as two k pi plus p theta like this. Okay. Now, please understand here, when you change your p theta with 2k pi plus t theta, k being some integer, I will tell you what integers uh, k can take. Please note that both cos and sine are periodic with 2 pi. Correct? So changing your angle with a multiple of 2 pi is not going to impact the result. That means cos p theta and cos 2k pi plus p theta would still be the same values. Isn't it? Isn't it? Cos 30 degree and cos 2 pi plus 30 degree or cos 4 pi plus 30 degree or cos 6 pi plus 30 degree or cos minus 2 pi plus 30 degree doesn't make any difference to your answer. Answer is still cos 30 root 3 by 2. Right? Same goes with sine as well. Sine is also periodic with 2 pi. So any change in the angle by a multiple of 2 pi is not going to affect the trigonometric ratio. Okay. Now this guy said, okay, after you have done this, Take this one by Q and multiply it with the arguments which you see over here. In short, okay, do one by Q multiplication with the argument, right? Just like we used to do in the case one of our Moivre theorem. Okay. And then he said, give K, give K any Q consecutive integral values. Normally we give it as one, two, three till Q minus one. Okay, but in reality, you can actually give any Q consecutive integral values. Integral values. 
Now, as you provide k, these q consecutive integral values, one one root will come out from there. So when you put k consecutive, sorry, q consecutive integral values, you will end up getting q different answers, and those answers would be the answer for z to the power p by q. Okay. Now I'm not going to give you the proof for this. We we don't require the proof for this, right? You just have to understand this mechanism. Okay. So he said that all your roots or all your answers of z to the power n. Which is p by q in this case can be obtained from here, which is r to the power p by q cos 2 k pi plus p theta by q whole whole divided by q plus i sine 2 k pi plus p theta whole divided by q, where k can take any q consecutive integral values, but preferably start with zero because they are. I mean, many people ask me, sir, if I go beyond it, what will happen? If I now if I put k as q, what will happen? If you put k as q. You will end up getting the same answer what you got for zero. If you put q plus one, you'll get the same answer as what you got for one. So there's no point going beyond q minus one because there will be a repetition of your roots happening. Once again, the whole process. What do we do? Uh, what we can do, Setu here? We can take an example. Example uh, will help us understand this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll take an example. Don't worry. So keep this result in your mind and uh, your uh, notes. We'll discuss it through an example. Okay. So let's say I want to uh, let's say I take a complex number one. Okay. One is also a complex number, isn't it? Correct. Okay. I've taken a simplest case. Now I raise this complex number to the power of p by q, where p is one and q is three. That means I'm finding the cube root of one. Okay. Uh, I had actually taken this case very briefly in the bridge course, where I told you that uh, if you raise one to the power of one third, you will get three answers. What we actually knew that time was only one of the answers, which was one. Okay, so that is only one of the answers. There are two more actually. So today is the right opportunity that we find what are the other two values. Okay, and we'll talk about it also because it's a part of our uh, syllabus for J. So one as a complex number, if you write it. It's one cos zero plus i sine zero. Okay. Uh, thankfully, uh, p is actually a one, so I don't have to worry too much about multiplying with one because it, it will not affect our answer. So it directly becomes something like this: cos zero plus i sine zero to the power of one third. Okay. Now, people who join in late, or you know, for that matter, say two as well. So, to what you do next is you you change your for, sorry one to the power one by three. Can I just write it as a one? I don't want to complicate it like writing it as one to the power one by three. Uh, you just write your angle here as two k pi plus zero. Okay, basically I am at this step now. I am at this step now. Okay, the okay uh, there was a power of one by q. I was at that step which I erased here. Now multiply it with one by q. That means multiply this with one third. That means you have to divide this by a three. So right now you are at this step, this step here. Okay, understood. Now k has to be provided with values starting from. I mean, you can provide any three consecutive integer values, but we normally start from zero. Normally start from zero. It is not a compulsion. So you can put zero, one, and go up till q minus one. See, remember here q is q is three. So you have to go till q minus one, which is two. So now what will happen if you put k as zero? Let's check. If you put k as zero, you'll end up getting cos zero by three i sine zero by three. What is that? What is cos zero plus i sine zero? One only. Correct. So this is one of the real roots which we already know. I mean, even without solving it, we knew that one of the answers would have been one only. If you put k as one, it will give you cos two pi by three plus i sine two pi by three. Correct. By the way, if you simplify this, this gives you minus half plus i root three by two. Okay. If you put k as a two, if you put k as a two, your answer will be cos four pi by three. Plus i sine four pi by three, okay, 
And if you simplify this, in fact, this is not a polar form for it. Uh, the polar form for it is actually cos minus 2 pi by 3 plus i sine minus 2 pi by 3. Why this is not a polar form? Because uh, this angle is not in the principal argument, right? You should normally keep it as a principal argument. Anyways, um, these two, whatever, if you calculate, it gives you minus half minus i root 3 by 2. Okay, so these are the three cube roots of unity. If you cube each one of them, you'll see that you will always get a one as your answer. Okay, try cubing this. Maybe after the class is over, you can try it out. Try cubing this, you will get a one. Of course, one cube is anyways a one. Okay. Is the process understood now? Clear? Okay, now I'll give you a small uh, uh, you know, question to work on. Everybody, please find out uh, cube roots of minus one. Okay, find cube roots of minus one. Do it and let me know by writing it done on the chat box that you're done. Setu, are you clear with the approach now? Any, yeah, any discomfort with respect to any step? Do let me know, okay? Yes, Pratish, that is one of the answers. What are the other two answers? <laughs> Sir, we want when we want to find sum of roots, is it helpful to take k plus 1 from minus k by 2 to k by 2 or sums? Some of the roots you want. Some of the roots will be 0 always. You're talking about these cases, one to the power one by three or something. Yeah, some of the roots will always be zero. Now, very interestingly, why it will be zero? I'll discuss about that also because it's there in my agenda. See, uh, when you have these kind of complex numbers, let's say one to, uh, z to the power one third, and you're trying to find out the complex roots of it. Okay, so basically, you're trying to find out. Uh, let's say I take a variable X. Okay. Let's say X is one of the roots of it. That means you're trying to find out the roots of this equation, right? And in this equation, you will see that there is no X square component. There's no X square term, right? And you would have already done it in class 10 that the sum of the roots of a cubic equation is minus B by A, right? It's actually true for any polynomial equation. So if you see, there is no B term here, B is zero. So B by one, that is zero by one will anyways be a zero. Okay. So some of the roots here will definitely be zero. I will talk about it. This is uh, there in my uh, discussion list today. Don't worry. Yes. So uh, are you all done with this? If you don't mind, can you type your answer on the chat box if you want to? We'll discuss everything. We'll discuss everything. Done? Okay. So first of all, let's write down one as a polar form. So one as a polar form is R cis pi, isn't it? Correct. Now I'm raising it to the power of one third. That means I'm raising this to the power of one third. Right. So as already discussed, uh, this will become cos 2k pi plus pi by 3 i sine 2k pi 
plus pi by three. Okay, and uh, you have to you have to put your k values as consecutive three values. You can see, choose zero, one, and two. Okay, so when you put a zero, when you put a zero, the complex number that you attain is cos pi by three plus i sine pi by three. By the way, when you simplify it, it gives you half plus i root three by two. Okay, and if you put a one, it will give you it will give you cos. Ah, uh, this will become a pi. This will also become a pi, and the answer will be minus one. So minus one definitely will be one of my answers, which I think Pratej already told. Okay, and the third answer that I will get will be when you put cos s two. So if you put cos s two, you'll get cos five pi by three. Okay, plus i sine five pi by three. Cos five pi by three is a half, and sine i pi by three is a negative root three by two. Okay, so these are your three cube roots of negative one. These are your three cube roots of negative one. Okay, now going back, going back to the square roots. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah, cube roots of one. Please note down this particular complex number is famously written as omega. Now, why famously written as omega? uh many times you will see that in your uh, you know questions they will say you uh, know there is a complex number omega which is a complex cube root of unity that means they are referring to this particular number as the as omega okay but please note omega in general doesn't represent minus half plus i root 3 by 2 omega could be used for any complex number also normally z omega alpha etc we keep on using for complex number also so let's say if they say there is a complex number omega and they further you know give some other de details to you please do not assume that that omega is actually minus half plus i root 3 by 2 so please watch out for the phrase that omega is a complex cube root of unity okay so this is what they call as call as omega okay and this term which basically the second term that you see over here This is omega square. This is omega square. Now, is omega square a kind of a symbol? Is it actually the square of omega? Yes, it is actually the square of omega. Because if you square this up, you will realize that by De Morgan's theorem, it will give you cos four pi by three plus i sine four pi by three, which is exactly this complex number. So this is called omega, and this is called omega square. So hence we say the cube roots of unity. We normally write cube roots of unity. Our cube roots of one, we normally write them as one omega and omega square. Now you must be thinking, sir, they look like to be in a geometric progression. Yes, they are in a geometric progression. Okay, it's just a name given to it. Why do you call it? Why do you call angular velocity as omega? Why do you call uh, <laughs> uh, your uh, angular acceleration as alpha? Just a name given to it. People refer to it. That's it. No story behind it. No story behind it. Okay, is it fine? Any questions? So uh, I gave you an exercise of finding the cube roots of negative one. You can note down here that the cube roots of negative one. Can you see that this term is actually a negative omega, negative omega square, and this term is actually negative omega. Okay, so note down. This is something that you can remember also. Uh, cube roots of Cube roots of negative one are minus one, minus omega, and minus omega square. Okay, so if you know uh, cube roots of unity, you can also find out cube roots of minus one. Okay, now we will analyze uh, you know this particular rule uh, through some problems. So let us look at look into some problems where we will apply our Both the formats of De Moivre's theorem, okay, and we will try to understand more through the problem-solving aspect. Okay, anything that you want to copy here or anything that you would like to ask here, please do so. These three are in geometric progression. Ah, uh, what do you think? Are they in the geometric progression? Yes, they are. Common ratio is omega. okay i will come back to cube roots of unity but only after taking one or two questions okay so let me take some questions
Okay, so uh, let me begin with a simple question here. Question is cos theta plus i sin theta to the power four divided by sin theta plus i cos theta to the power five. Express this as a plus i b. In short, give the value of a and b. Of course, it'll come out in terms of uh, cos and sin of theta and all. I mean, theta would definitely be there in some form. So give me the value of a and b. Done. Uh, can you tell what is your A value coming out and B value coming out? Okay. See, uh, there's no problem with the numerator. Numerator is plain and simple. It is very much in the in the form where we can easily apply our De Moivre's theorem. Okay. The denominator is not in the form which we would like to see it in. So what I'll do is I will slightly focus on the denominator aspect of it. Uh, first of all, this term itself, if I take a I common, okay, if I take an I common, I'll end up getting cos theta minus I sin theta. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Now treat this, treat this as cos minus theta plus I sin minus theta. Correct. Now, opposite of De Moivre's theorem, if you apply, it is actually cos theta plus i sin theta to the power of minus one, isn't it? Minus one only on this, okay, not on the entire thing. Okay. Now, the given expression to me is sin theta plus i cos theta, and if I raise it to the power of five, it is as good as i to the power of five, and this is nothing but cos theta plus i sin theta to the power of minus five. I to the power of five is I, correct? And let's not uh, disturb this expression because uh, we can simplify our complete expression by using this format only. Now let us come back to our question. Okay, let's look at this expression. Can I write this expression now as cos theta plus I sine theta to the power of four and denominator, I have reduced it to i times cos theta plus i sin theta to the power of minus 5. Okay. You may use your exponent laws here and write it as cos theta plus i sin theta to the power of 9. 1 by i is uh, minus i. Please note that 1 by i is a minus i. Now, as per De Moivre's theorem, I can write this as cos 9 theta plus i sin 9 theta. Once you multiply your minus i throughout, you'll end up getting sine 9 theta minus i cos 9 theta. Correct? And just compare it with a plus ib. Compare it with a plus ib. 
so when you do that a becomes sin 9 theta and b becomes minus of cos 9 theta i hope those who have solved it you would have got this as your answer what is 4 theta minus 5 theta that also you will not simplify ha huh? <laughs> chalo fir bhi wo galat hi hai but still <laughs> Have you seen people giving answer like two plus three? Are they right or five? <laughs> okay, how many of you got this answer? Type of me on the chat box. Huh? Nobody. Rama Krishna, what is happening? Okay, anyways, we'll take uh, we'll take another problem. Any question you have here, please do ask. any question that you have please do ask okay <clears throat> good enough fine so my next question is my next question is find find minus 32 to the power 1 by 4 that means find four fourth roots of minus 32 okay find four fourth roots of minus 32 uh sorry uh, not minus 32 my bad uh, let let's keep it 16 minus 16 just to keep it simple <laughs> okay minus 16 Okay, find four fourth roots of minus sixteen. Okay, that's a uh, first part of the question. Second part of the question is locate the roots. Locate the roots on the argon pin. Okay, that's it. So please solve this question. Find minus sixteen to the power of one by four, and locate the the four fourth roots of minus sixteen on the argon pin. Once you have located, we'll discuss a little bit more about it. just follow the de moivre's theorem that we had discussed in the beginning of our today's class okay just follow step by step uh, meanwhile when you solve that i will give you a shorter way to find all the roots okay you don't have to follow every step of de moivre's theorem we can cut corners and we can solve these questions in a faster way which will be very helpful for you in your examination scenario when you have lack of time okay should i also participate along with you so 16 minus 16 as a polar form is r cis pi isn't it r cos pi plus i sin pi correct clear now you are raising it to the power of 1/4 so basically this is what you are you will be getting okay correct me if i am wrong i'm just skipping some steps because i don't want to write each and every step over here I sign. Okay, so it's a very good attempt. We'll check it out whether your answer is correct or not. Okay. Now, sixteen to the power one by four. This itself will give you four answers, right? 
so here is thing that i was actually talking about in the you know when i was discussing the demoverse theorem in the beginning of today's session that you have to maintain a real positive value over here a real positive value you have to keep so which is the you know direct answer that comes in your mind when you do fourth root of 16 which is the real positive answer that comes in your mind see if you just talk about real there could be two answers four and uh, sorry uh, two and a minus two but minus 2 cannot be your modulus right modulus of a complex number is always a positive quantity so think of a real positive answer that comes in your mind when you do fourth root of 16 the answer only answer is a 2 in your mind right okay so keep, write it as a 2 no need to no need to you can just take a pi common here also if you want okay now start putting values of k you could put any four consecutive integral values but preferably we start with zero only so zero 1 2 and let me make some space for myself 3 okay when you put a zero the very first answer that you will get as your one of the fourth roots will be 2 cos pi by 4 plus i sin pi by 4 2 cos pi by 4 plus i sin pi by 4. Correct me if I'm wrong. Clear? Any questions? Okay. The next root that you will get when you put k as a one is 2 cos 3 pi by 4 plus i sin 3 pi by 4. Right now I'm just writing the general argument. Okay. i'm not converting it to the principal argument okay so whatever answer comes out from putting k value that i'm writing as such i'm not making any kind of a change to the general argument because i want to show you some analysis sorry for that sound <laughs> now if you put k as 2 you get cos 5 pi by 4 plus i sin 5 pi by 4 okay and when you put k as 3 you get cos 7 pi by 4 plus i sin 7 pi by 4 is it fine so far so good any questions okay so if you locate these four roots of minus 16 on the argon plane they will be located at these positions all of you please pay attention the first root will be located at a distance of 2 and at an argument of pi by 4 okay so at a distance of 2 and at an argument of pi by 4 the first root will be located so i'll be just making a simple plane diagram over here and i'll locate my first root okay can i call them as uh, alpha beta gamma delta just to refer to them alpha beta gamma delta so this is your alpha position okay so this complex number or this root will be your alpha okay second root if you uh, see carefully that is also located at the very same distance from the origin which is 2 because its modulus is also 2 but if you see that argument has increased by argument has increased by pi by 2 correct pi by 2 is actually 2 pi by 4 now why i am calling it as 2 by 4 2 pi by 4 because i'll be showing you a trick a way a simple shortcut way so at a difference of pi by 2 from the alpha position okay and at a distance of 2 you will get your second root let's call it as beta so please note that this gap will be this gap will be 90 degree and you see that the same gap of 90 degree will be continuing for gamma as well from beta so gamma will also be at a gap of 90 degree okay and same at a distance of 2 only just like these complex were numbers were from the origin so this will be a gamma and delta would be again at a 90 degree 90 degree phase difference or argument difference you can say okay so this will also be this will also be 90 degrees and of course this will also be 90 degrees only this will be your gamma okay now looking at this looking at this entire scenario i have got a simple technique to locate 
these routes without actually doing all these stuffs. Okay. Now, what is the technique? I'll come back. I'll come to that technique now here. Okay. So please listen to this trick to find any complex number to the power of P by Q. Okay. Trick to find any complex number to the power of P by Q. Okay. So all of you, please listen to this very, very important. Okay. You have to do the following steps. First step is, first step is find, uh, by the way, you are already given this complex number. You will be always already be provided with this complex number. Don't worry about it. So you would be knowing, a, you will be knowing the modulus and you would be knowing the argument of Z, right? So first step is find first step is find R to the power of P by Q. Okay. Please take the real positive number because it represents the modulus of your roots. Modulus is always a positive real quantity. Okay. Right. First step is find R to the power P by Q. Okay. Take the positive real value. Second step is Second step is locate the first root at a distance of r to the power p by q found in step number one and at an argument of P theta by Q. So theta would be known to you. R would be known to you. So you know how to find P theta by Q. So your first complex number, that is your first answer. The first root, I would say, would be located at this distance from the origin. From the origin that I forgot to write from the origin and at an argument of P theta by Q. Clear? Then the second root would be located at a distance of same R to the power P by Q from the origin. Okay. From the origin. Let me just do a ditto mark here also from the origin. And the argument would be argument would be the argument of the first root plus two pi by Q. So increase the argument of the previous one by two pi by Q. Are you getting my point and keep doing it. That means if you want to locate your third root, it would be located at a distance of same R to the power P by Q from the origin and argument would be P theta by Q. Now add another two pi by Q to this. That means keep adding, keep adding two pi by Q to your previous argument. Keep adding two pi by Q to the argument of the previous root. Okay. Now this is how you can easily figure out all the roots and locate them also on the argon plane. So precisely this is what happened over here. So if you see this example, I will demonstrate what I said. My modulus of that complex number was 16, right? So first I found out 16 to the power one by four, the positive real root came out to be two. Okay. The argument of this complex number was pi. Of course, P was one. So P theta by Q will become P was actually one Q was four. So P theta by Q would actually become a pi by four. So if you see first complex number look was located at a modulus of or at a distance of two from the origin and at an angle of pi by four. After that, what I did after that, I kept on locating the other complex number by just adding two pi by four, that is pi by two. So keep adding, keep adding, keep adding this to the argument of argument of 
the previous root and you will keep finding out the uh, alpha you will get a beta by adding pi by 2 so see this is pi by 2 again add a pi by 2 you get gamma again add a pi by 2 you will get sorry uh, delta this is delta my bad i wrote a gamma here my mistake this is delta yeah again if you add a pi by 2 you will come back to alpha only so there is no point doing it are you getting my point i will give you another demonstration for it don't worry ha huh. your roots will start repeating so you don't need, need not go any further okay till you have uh, taken care of your q roots stop no need to go any further okay another observation you will see here is that yes i will slide the screen once again just give me a minute if you connect these roots by a you can say a polygon kind of a structure you would always realize that you will get a regular polygon in this case it will give you a square so this would be a regular polygon in this case it is a square okay this case will always be a square so please note that no matter whatever is the complex number given to you and somebody is asking you to locate the roots of that complex number raised to the power of p by q you will always get a q sided regular polygon from there if you connect all your roots on the argon plane always that's always going to happen okay is this fine okay tejasvini wanted to copy something from this root tejasvini i'll give you a demonstration also of this which will make our life very simple please note these things i mean these things are not written in books okay so many things i will be telling you from my uh, you know experience mostly okay they will not be mentioned in the books done this diagram hmm this is the diagram you wanted setu yeah that okay let's take another question uh let's say uh, i ask you this question find find Mm, what should i do mm. let's say i take a complex number mm, root 3 plus i okay and i raise it to the power of mm, 2 so that will give me a modulus will be is it to the power of let's say 3 by 5 okay i'm just taking a you know harbert case so find root 3 plus i raised to the power of 2 by 5 okay that is your first part of the question second part of the question is locate the roots on the argon plane locate the roots on the argon plane okay now in the interest of time i will only solve this question okay so please pay attention i'll just use the trick to solve this question and nothing else is required ah uh, yes madam p by q should be in the simplest ratio i think you had missed out writing this in the previous slide i had written maybe here look at the top you see something express in the simplest form nahi <laughs> to if you write 1 by 2 as 100 by 200 you will not get 200 answers right <laughs> okay let's go back to the question yeah now the simplest way to get this answer very easily i will just directly plot it on the diagram okay i will get five answers from here right 
because this uh, base is a five. Okay, so first find r of the complex number. So z, let's say it is root three plus i. So what is r of the complex number? R of the complex number is who will tell me? What is modulus of z? Fast, 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 fast. Two, correct. What is the argument of z? Or theta, what we call as? Fast, 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 fast. Pi by six, correct? So locate your first root. So out of those five roots, the first one will be located at a distance of two to the power three by five, okay? And at an argument of, and at an argument of five by six into three by five. So multiply this with three by five. In fact, this will give you pi by 10, isn't it? So your first complex number will be located at pi by 10 is almost 18 degrees. So that will be very, you know, small angle here. So 18 degrees, somewhat like this. Okay. And this distance will be two to the power of three by five. So two to the power three by five, if I calculate it on my uh, calculator, I mean, that is not a value that you, you can remember. So I just use my calculator. Give me one second. It's around 1.51. 1.51 ish. Okay. Anyways. So at an angle of, at an angle of whatever is this value, which is pi by 18, sorry, pi by 10. Okay. Your first root will be located. So let's say the roots are, uh, I will call those roots by the name of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and let's say kappa. Okay. Kappa, another Greek name. Okay. Now, after this, you don't have to worry anything. You just take two pi divided by the base that is Q value two pi by five, keep increasing this pi by 10 by two pi by five. So two pi by five is almost, uh, if I'm not mistaken, two pi by five is 72 degrees. Correct. So keep increasing this 18 degrees by 72 degrees each. So let me write it in terms of uh, degrees only so that you can easily understand it. So now keep increasing by 72 degrees. So 72 degrees will take you to here. And this will be again at the same distance of two to the power three by five. So this will be your position of the second root. So let's say this was alpha, then this will be your beta, right? So this gap will be 72 degrees gap clear. And this distance will be two to the power three by five only. Correct. Now you, when you know the location, you can always write that complex number in the oil, uh, polar form or Euler form, whatever you feel like. Okay. Then again, from here goes 72 degrees more. Okay. So you'll reach here. Correct. So again, take a jump of 72 degrees more from here. So you'll reach this position. Okay. And this position will be your third root. Let's say gamma. Correct. Again, from there, 72 degrees more. Okay, this will be 72 degrees and you will reach your fourth root delta. Hey, yo, let me write in white delta. Okay, and all of them will be at the same distance. Okay, I'm not writing it, but please note that they will all be at a distance of two to the power three by five from the origin. Okay, Achha, by the way, one more root is left off that I would have. Yeah, let me write it. Okay, so this would be your third root, let's say kappa. Kappa. Okay, and this gap will be again a 72 degree gap. If you further increase by 72 degree, you will reach alpha. <laughs> this gap will also be 72 degree. Are you getting my point? So these roots are positioned uniformly in the space at equidistant, you know, you can say argument difference apart. And they will all be at the same distance of R to the power of P by Q from the origin. Correct. So looking at this, you can always write alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and kappa in whatever form you feel like. Do you want me to write them down? Okay. Let me write them down. Your alpha will be two to the power three by five, cis pi by 10. Okay. Beta will be two to the power three by five, cis. I uh, just added two by five to this, uh, by the way, two by uh, two pi by five is four pi by 10. So that makes my addition simpler. So that makes five pi by 10, five pi by 10 is pi by two. Okay. Gamma will be two to the power three by five cis. Add another four pi by 10 to this, by the way, this was five pi by 10. So it will be nine pi by 10. 
Now I may exceed the principal argument. Okay, so if you want to write it in principal argument, please do so. Uh, delta will be two to the power three by five cis. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this will be thirteen pi by ten. And kappa will be kappa will be two to the power three by five cis seventeen pi by ten. Okay, so these will be your five cube roots of root three plus i. Sorry. Uh, Uh, this will be five answers to this particular operation is it fine right so directly you can get your result without you know writing any single word also of course you write the relevant things and as i told you if you connect them you will always get a regular polygon in this case it will be a regular pentagon this will be a regular pentagon now in je and other exams they may ask you this question like that okay they will say let's say if i were a question setter i will say uh, if you locate all the values of root 3 plus uh, i to the power of 3 by 5 on a argand plane okay you will get a polygon find the side length of the polygon that would be a question isn't it i can ask you to find the side length of the polygon i can ask you the area of the polygon right all these things can be asked i could i could also ask you the uh, uh radius of the circle circumscribing this polygon correct i could ask you the radius of a circle inscribed within this polygon anything any type of questions can be framed okay so please be prepared for those kind of questions also so i think we have done you know uh, concept of uh, the de moivre's theorem in very detail now let us move on to something uh, called the properties of cube roots of unity so this is something which is important normally i uh, do it exactly after my first example but never mind so let's go to let's go to the properties of cube roots of unity any question here anybody do let me know okay so properties of of cube roots of unity so cube roots of unity you already know uh, are one okay one omega omega square now since they all have come from cube root of one that means if you cube them they will give you a one isn't it So of course one cube is a one we all know that, and omega cube, or let's say omega square cube, etc. They will all give you a one. In general, I can say. In general, I can say if you raise omega to any multiple of three power, of course n should be an integer here, that will always give you a one. That means omega to the power six, omega to the power nine, twelve, etc., etc. They will all give you a one. Okay. If you do omega to the power, which is a multiple of three plus one, you'll get a omega back. And if you do omega to the power a multiple of three plus two, you'll get omega square again. Okay, that is obvious. Okay, no need to uh, explain anything over there. The Jaswini has a question: How to get those answers you just asked? Huh? Which answers? Oh, questions that I just asked. that is up to you tejasvini <laughs> everything i give you then what will be your thinking see take pleasure in solving the question not in knowing the answer right it's a big statement take pleasure in solving the question rather than knowing the answer right means is important than the goal in learning means is you should say sir i will try to find it out and i will let you know that is how it should be right rather than you knowing from me everything <laughs> of course i try to tell you as much as i can but these are things which you can always do it yourself right it's just basis of trigonometry so a regular poly polygon how do you find the side length you, you can usually find it by use of trigonometry you find the area of the polygon also by use of trigonometry okay so try to get those answers on your own not a difficult thing if you are stuck while finding it out then i'll help you next important thing is we already know that 
omega value is minus half plus i root 3 by 2 and omega square value is minus half minus i root 3 by 2. So looking at it, it's very obvious. So this implies that omega and omega squares are actually conjugates of each other, isn't it? So please note that omega and omega square are conjugates of each other. And since omega cube is 1, that means omega into omega square is 1. That means omega and omega squares are reciprocal also of each other. Very interesting relation. Okay. So not only omega and omega squares are conjugates of each other, they are also reciprocals of each other. So if you do 1 by omega, you'll get omega square. If you do 1 by omega square, you'll get an omega. Okay, so they are conjugates also, and they are they are they are reciprocals also of each other. By the way, since you know they are conjugates, let's look into their uh, positioning on the argon plane. So if this is one, this is omega, this is omega square. Okay, please note omega and omega square are conjugates of each other, so they will be mirror imaged about the real z axis correct and as already discussed with you if you connect these complex numbers you will get a regular polygon okay in this case the polygon is a equilateral triangle okay so this will be a equilateral triangle in this case please understand here the side length will be root 3 okay so this equilateral triangle side length will be root 3. How did I figure it out? Not a rocket science. I know omega is minus half comma root 3 by 2. And omega square is minus half minus root 3 by 2. So the distance between omega and omega square is twice of root 3 by 2, which is root 3. Okay. So this equilateral triangle side length is root 3. Area would be root 3 a square by 4. I hope everybody knows the area of an equilateral triangle whose side length is given to you root 3 a square by 4. So in this case, it will be 3 root 3 by 4. Right? Now it is a triangle, I could find it easily. If it is a square, that also you can find easily. If it is a pentagon, you have to construct small, small triangles inside and drop a perpendicular and find it. So I'm just giving you a hint how to do it. Okay. Any question with respect to you know whatever properties I have taken so far? Now, a very interesting property which is going to be used several times in many questions. I think uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, I was doing a determinant chapter with your seniors, and this property which I am going to give you now had appeared in one of the questions. Thankfully, everybody remembered it. <laughs> one plus omega plus omega square is a zero. Now, this can be achieved from several angles. Okay. Uh, I think Nikhil was asking a little while ago, some of the roots, some of the roots is a zero here. So several ways to, you know, basically uh, come to this approach. One is by literally putting the values, you know, your values of omega and omega square. So if I put the values, you will really see that they get canceled out and leaving you a zero leaving you with a zero. So one gets cancelled with a minus half minus half. I root 3 by 2 minus I root 3 by 2 gets cancelled, gives you a zero. Another way of looking at it is uh, these equations. Okay. Oh, sorry, these roots, they come from solving this equation. That is solving ZQ minus 1 equal to 0. Which on factorization gives you something like this. Correct where the first factor is responsible for one as your one of the roots the second factor is responsible for omega and omega square in short omega and omega square appear from solving so these are you can say omega and omega square are roots of z square plus z plus one equal to zero so if you apply your uh, you can say quadratic equation formula. This is what you are going to get the values. So here, if you see omega should satisfy this equation, right? Right. So omega square plus omega plus one should be zero because omega is the root of that equation, right? So this gives you another way of looking at it. Okay. Third way of looking at it is something which I already discussed uh, a little while ago. 
if you see that this this uh, cubic equation doesn't have a z square term that means if i write it as a proper cubic polynomial equation where a is your uh, one b is zero c is also zero d is uh, minus one the sum of the roots whatever roots i get that should be minus b by a which is minus zero by one which is anyways a zero so there are three ways of looking at it so ultimately one plus omega plus omega square will definitely give you a zero okay another way of looking at it is many people will say sir i know this is a geometric series i hope most of you would have done geometric series in school so first sum is one common ratio is omega so i can write it like this as a sum of a geometric series now omega cube is a one so one minus one will be a zero i mean so many ways to look at it the property will stand out irrespective of any path you take is it fine now this property number three i will generalize a bit sir you have a habit of generalizing lot of things that's how you should actually study whenever you solve a question <laughs> try to see can this be generalized can i you know scale this up okay that's how in life we actually scale businesses also correct <laughs> let's say tomorrow i learn how to make a pot and i am very impressed with my you know <laughs> uh, craftsmanship i said ah pot is very good so then i'll think इसको स्केल अप कर सकते हैं क्या कैन आई मेक थाउजेंड पॉट्स कैन आई बिकम रिच बाय दैट ओके दैट्स हाउ बिजनेसेस आल्सो ग्रो सो ऑल दैट यू नो यू कैन से लर्निंग ऑफ लाइफ सो दिस जेई वे इज वेरी सिंपल एग्जाम राइट वी आर लर्निंग फॉर सक्सेस इन लाइफ एंड योर स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट इज यू नो दीस प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग्स सो दीस प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग्स आर योर स्मॉल गेम्स व्हिच यू लर्न टू टैकल द बिगर प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ लाइफ right i always keep on saying to my students je iit engineering medical the preparation that you are doing is just a you can say simulation of how do you solve problems later on in your life maybe as engineers or as doctors somebody comes with you uh, let's say with a something which has not been seen in past right say setu becomes an engineer right and i am a big builder i come to him and say i want this construction to be done so to saying that nobody has done such a construction in you know in my engineering study so far so that's what is the challenge for him that's what the problem for him to solve that's why he is an engineer isn't it somebody comes to a you know doctor sir i have this problem the doctor may not have seen that disease you know in in his past but he will basically try to figure out you know what what to do to make this so as medical students as engineers whatever you are trying to pursue the bigger goal is to solve questions or problems in life isn't it that's how that's how businesses are built that's how problems in the society are taken care of anyways too much of philosophy <laughs> let's go back to uh, the generalized format so i will generalize this i will generalize this 1 to the power p omega to the power p and omega square to the power p or you can say omega to the power 2p okay this will always give you a zero if p is not a multiple of 3 whereas this will give you a 3 if p is a multiple of 3 is a multiple of 3 okay now the second uh, you know answer is very simple you say sir if p is a multiple of 3 then all of them will be like omega raised to the power a multiple of 3 so 1 plus 1 plus 1 3 simple as that so how do you get the first one how do you get the first one that it is zero if p is not a multiple of 3 now here the trick is very simple again we all have learned our gp even if you have not learned your gp you definitely have seen the formula in the past right okay without gp also i can solve it but let's use a gp if you know it a geometric this is a geometric series okay this is a geometric series i'm sure most of you would have already started sequence and series in your school as well okay and the sum is this isn't it we all know this so treat this as a gp whose first term is 1 common ratio common ratio is omega to the power p number of terms are 3 so as per this your sum will be how much sum will be a which is 
Okay, let me write equal to here, else you'll think I'm summing up that. Yeah, one omega to the power of p raised to the power n, so omega to the power n p minus one by omega to the power p minus one. Correct. Now please note, since p is not a multiple of three. Which means omega to the power p cannot be one. Your denominator will be a non-zero term, whereas your numerator will become one minus one. See, this is going to be, this is going to be, this is going to be. By the way, n is a three here. Sorry for writing n. Yeah, this is going to be a multiple of three anyhow because three into any integer, even though the p integer is not a multiple of three. Let's say p is two. So three p will anyways be in. In a multiple of uh, three only, so this will anyhow be one. So this will become zero divided by a non-zero quantity, which anyways will be a zero, which anyways will be a zero. Correct? Is this fine? Now many people ask me, sir, can you justify this three answer also from the same result, rather than you know telling that each one of them will be one, 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 and hence you'll get a three? Can I get three answer from the same result? Can I use this result? Can I use this result to get three answer when p is a multiple of three? Can I get this answer? Anybody can tell me how to do it. This is here where your thinking comes into picture. <laughs> tell, 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 tell. Okay. See if omega. Uh, if p is a multiple of three, omega will be actually one, right? Okay, let's call it as a variable y. So what you have here is y cube minus one by y minus one. If you take a limiting case, okay. If you remember, I had done a standard algebraic limit which gives you three one to the power three minus one. So that gives you three. So here you have to take a limiting case as y tends to one. Okay. So this limit is a very interesting concept. In the later part of our chapter, we will try to solve few questions by applying limits. Okay. So this is property number, I think, three only, three generalized forms. So let me write three here. Any questions? Any concerns? Do let me know. Fourth property is a simple one. Let's go to the fourth one as well and. Since you have learned that the roots of the roots of z square plus z plus one equal to zero are omega and omega square, can I do this? Can I factorize this term as z minus omega, z minus omega square? Can I do that? Could you wait for two minutes? Yes, yes. Why not? Now fine done. Anything that you would like to copy? Done. Okay. Okay. So guys, please note. I mean, I've used a variable x now. So instead of z, even if you have an x. So up till now we knew that this is not factorizable, right? But now, after we have done cube roots of unity, we know that this can also be factorized. Okay. That means this expression which you had. Which used to stop at this position. Now you can actually write it fully as x minus one, x minus omega, x minus omega square. Okay. You can further generalize this. You can further generalize this and say that any a q minus b q expression can be factorized as a minus b, a minus b omega, and a minus b omega square. Please note this down. Okay. We also know that we also know that 
we also know that minus omega and minus omega square are roots of or are are two of the roots of minus 1 to the power 1/3 right which is as good as saying z cube is minus 1 which means z cube plus 1 is 0 which means if you factorize this okay please note they will actually be roots of this two this equation okay because this will only give a minus 1 so in short i what i what uh, what i wanted to tell you that is minus omega and minus omega square are uh, roots of z square minus z plus 1 equal to 0 that means you could actually factorize this also as z plus omega z plus omega square i mean even if you write it in terms of x the property doesn't change so x square plus x x square minus x plus 1 could always be written as x plus omega x plus omega square now remember when you used to factorize x cube plus 1 you used to stop at x plus 1 into x square minus x plus 1 but now no need to stop there you can further factorize it if the case requires you to do so okay so in general please note down a cube plus b cube sorry i have reached the end of the page so i cannot drag it any further down a cube plus b cube can be factorized as a plus b a plus b omega a plus b omega square is it fine any questions any concerns so far now i would like you to work out a question for homework not now for homework prove that a cube plus b cube plus c cube minus 3 abc prove that this could actually be factorized as a plus b plus c into a plus b omega plus c omega square a plus b omega square c omega okay i know most of you already know that this this actually can be written like this a plus b plus c A square plus B square plus C square minus AB minus BC minus CA. All you need to show, uh, you know, in your homework or try to prove in your homework that this part is obtained by multiplying these two. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's very easy to prove. You can definitely do it. So please try this out. Many people ask sir, uh, after proving it, should we remember this result? I would say yes. I mean. Maybe useful somewhere. Can I take a question now on uh, cube roots of unity? Just one question I will take. I will not uh, go into a lot of questions. Clear, everyone. Can I go to the question? Okay. Let's try this question. If three by two plus i root three by two to the power of fifty is three to the power twenty five x minus i y. find the ordered pair x y or find x and y value simple as that uh give me a response on the chat box once you're done
Very good, Noel. Anybody else? Okay, let's let's solve this question. See, uh, let us first, you uh, know, try to analyze this expression. Okay, before we raise it to a power of fifty, is it somehow linked to omega? I have a feeling that if I take a root negative root three i common, okay, from this expression, I will end up getting minus half plus i root three by two. Yes, right. So basically, this expression is linked to omega. This is actually your omega, isn't it? Minus half plus i root three by two. That is omega. Okay, that will make my life very easy. So when I raise this, so when I raise this to the power of fifty, it is as good as raising this to the power of fifty. Okay, so minus sign will become uh, irrelevant when you are raising it to an even number power. So this will become three to the power twenty five. I to the power fifty, if I am not mistaken, is minus one, isn't it? I to the power fifty, fifty is of the nature four n plus two. So I to the power four n plus two is normally a minus one, and omega to the power fifty is omega to the power forty eight into omega square. Omega to the power forty eight will be anyways be a one, right? This will be a one because forty-eight is a multiple of three. Correct. So ultimately, your answer will be three to the power twenty-five minus one into omega square. Minus one into omega square will give you half plus i root three by two. Okay. So <laughs> from here, if you directly compare, you get your answers pretty straight away. X is half, and Y is negative root three by two. Exactly. So I think Noel got it right, and Prisham also got it right. Excellent. Is it okay? All right. So now this cube root of unity concept that we have learned, I am going to further scale it up, further generalize. What, sir? Again, generalize. <laughs> okay. So let's now talk about. Nth roots of unity, n could be anything. Okay, not only three; it could be any number, four, five, six, hundred, five hundred. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about n nth roots of unity. What about the minus sign over there? Where did it? Where did that go? It didn't go anywhere. Minus y is root three by two, so y is negative root three by two. Yes or no, <laughs> sir? Compare, no. अरे minus ये minus को आगे कर दिया ना? अ सर ये ये minus को इसके साथ जोड़ दिया. Sorry. Omega square itself is what is omega square? Omega square itself is minus half minus i root three by two, no? Minus omega square will become, huh? 
then will become half plus i root 3 by 2 okay okay uh, coming back to this concept yes so now we are going to further generalize it and we are now going to talk about nth roots of unity see the process is very simple process is the very same as what we had done to derive the cube roots of unity so one as a complex number you can write it as cos 0 plus i sin 0 and i already told you that we can do this operation by de moivre's theorem i will not write everything down i am just Okay, using de Moivre's theorem by de Moivre. Okay, and k you start putting as zero, one till 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 till. Who will tell me till? Da, 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 till. Write on your chat box. Till n minus one. Right, Shalini. Correct. Correct. Okay, so when you put a zero, you get a one only. When you put a one, you get cos two pi by n plus i sine two pi by n. Okay, normally, normally, the books will call this as alpha. Okay, or let us call this as alpha. Let's not blame books. Let's say I call it as alpha. Then I would like to know. The second, uh, when you put ks two, you get something like this, right? What would you call this as if you are calling this as alpha? Tell me. If you are calling this guy as alpha, then what would you call this guy as? Ah, say to think again before Think again before you answer. See, if you raise this to some power, and that power makes two pi by n as four pi by n, what should be that power? The power should be two, right? Yes, absolutely. So it is actually alpha square. Getting it? Okay. All right. So when you put uh, three, you get six pi by n plus i sine six pi by n. Now again, let me ask you the very same question. If this is alpha, then what will you call this guy? Alpha cube. Correct. If you keep on doing this. If you keep on doing this, you would realize that the last guy that I have over here, that means your nth root, that will be alpha to the power n minus 1. Okay. What I wanted you to appreciate here is that they again look like they again look like a geometric progression, isn't it? 1 alpha, alpha square, alpha cube, alpha to the power 4, da 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 da, alpha to the power n. Okay. So they look like a geometric uh, progression they look like a geometric progression okay and this is not a surprise because we had already seen a glimpse of it when we were talking about cube roots of unity one omega omega square was basically a specific case out of it right so one raised to any one by n power that means any nth root maybe fifth root sixth root seventh root hundred root five hundred root whatever the roots that will come out will always be in a geometric progression. Correct? Okay. Where alpha here is, I should write it down here, where alpha is. Let's not assume things. Okay, let's be very specific while we, were, while we are writing the notes. Just give me a second, I'll write it properly. <laughs> Where alpha is cos 2 pi by n plus i sine 2 pi by n. Okay. Now, many times uh, the questions in the book, they will not make it very explicit that it is, you know, alpha, alpha squared. They'll probably call it as the nth roots of unity is one. And they will give some number like alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, like that. Now, it is up to you to understand that, that alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, etc., that they have given, they're actually in geometric progression okay so many a times in the question they will not make it very obvious you will have to identify by your prior knowledge okay so please note this down and now we will take up some uh argon plane representation very simple so argon plane representation of n nth roots of unity will be first will be one 
second root will be again at a distance of 1 and this angle will be this angle will be how much this angle will be 2 pi by n so this is your alpha okay next will be located again at a distance of 1 again at a further change of 2 pi by an angle and this will be alpha square okay another root will be again at a distance of 1 again at a further change of argument by 2 pi by n and so on so if you keep you know making it and if you connect them you will realize that you will end up getting a a regular n sided polygon which i will not be able to make completely because I, have, I cannot sit and draw all the roots okay so this will be a regular a regular n sided polygon now here is an opportunity for you to figure out that let there be any n value how do you find out in terms of n the side length of this regular polygon okay so i have a question for all of you find in terms of n in terms of n two things side length of the regular polygon regular n gone and second question is find in terms of n area of the regular n gone. Okay, these two things you figure out for homework. Yes, if n becomes infinity, it'll actually become a circle. Right, absolutely right. Okay, so just like we took the properties of cube roots of unity, we will also take properties of n nth roots of unity. Right? So you'll realize that when I take those properties, uh, those properties, very specific versions are your cube roots of unity. So cube root properties are scaled up to get your uh, properties of n nth roots of unity. You will soon realize when I start taking them. Can I go to the next slide? Have you all copied this? This expression is very important actually, by the way, whenever you see such kind of an expression, you know, once you should, you know, think of, okay, this may be one of the nth roots n could be any number. For example, if you see something like this cos two pi by seven, plus i sine 2 pi by 7, right? If required, or if the question is oriented in such a way that it is related to the seventh root of unity, then this is one of the seventh root of unity. This is one of the seven seventh roots of unity. Okay. So keep this image in your mind because you never know when, you know, any complex number question may require you to apply it. Okay. So just as an example, I, you know, gave it to you. So any expression of the nature cos 2 pi by n plus i sine 2 pi by n is indicative of the fact that that is one of the, that is one of the n nth roots of unity. Depending upon n, whatever is given. For example, n could be a 7 in this case, 5, 11, 100, whatever. Depends upon the question. Now we will look into properties of n nth roots of one or unity the first property which is very obvious let's say alpha i'll just write it down let's say let one alpha one or let's say alpha alpha square etc b n nth roots of unity and if you take alpha the the one which i had discussed in the previous slide and you raise it to the power of n or you raise it to a power of any multiple of n that will always give you a one okay p being some integer okay so any multiple of n if you raise it on alpha that will give you a one okay next property 
next property is very similar to what we had done in our cube root of unity uh let me not give you like this let me give you like this let one this time i will change the name of okay the roots are the n nth roots of unity so please note in this question while i am giving you i am mentioned alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 in place of alpha alpha square alpha cube this is your internal understanding that they are in geometric progression but a external examiner when he is asking you a question he need not give you as a geometric progression it is up to you to figure out oh alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 they are in geometric progression so if i call one of them as alpha the other is alpha square alpha cube like that so he will not give you that okay they are in geometric progression it is up to you to figure that out okay so if they are n nth roots of unity please prove that the sum of these nth n nth roots of unity will always be a zero okay of course one way to prove this is knowing the fact that this is these are actually roots of these are actually roots of z to the power n minus 1 equal to 0 and there is no z to the power n minus 1 term so coefficient of z to the power n minus 1 as anyways a zero so that is another way to look at it but if you go by your uh, you can say uh, geometric progression formula so this is actually alpha this is actually alpha square and so on and this is actually alpha to the power n minus 1 okay so alpha 1 is actually your alpha then alpha 2 is alpha square and so on so if you look at your left hand side term it's clear cut a geometric progression correct okay? whose first term is one common ratio is alpha and number of terms are n so if you use your formula it becomes a alpha to the power of n minus 1 by alpha minus 1 now remember alpha to the power n from the previous property is a 1 so this will become 1 minus 1 alpha minus 1 this is a non zero term because alpha is not a 1 because one they have already cited separately so this is zero by a non zero quantity that is always be a zero so this property leads to another you can say uh, you can say sub property which is actually important and uh, i'll be giving you that property there the property is if you sum up cos 2k pi by n k from 0 to n minus 1 you will get a zero and if you sum up sin 2k pi by n k from 0 to n minus 1 this will also be a zero now you must be wondering how how is this coming and how is it coming from this property okay so first note this down <laughs> note these two uh, results down this comes directly from the fact that the sum of the n nth roots of unity is zero so please make a note of this please note down the limits of summation it is going from 0 to n minus 1 in reality it could be uh, some starting from any k value till n consecutive numbers okay 0 to n minus 1 is just one of the cases Okay, so first note this two result down, and then we'll discuss how it comes. Okay, now see, look at this result itself. This result that you have written over here. This result. All of you pay attention to this result here. One is what? One is cos zero plus i sin zero, right? So I will write it in a very fancy way. <laughs> two into zero into pi by n. And i sine two into zero into pi by n, correct? So this one that you had over here, I am writing it in a very fancy way, right? That is still a one, isn't it? The second term, alpha one, or which is alpha, whatever you want to call it, is actually cos two pi by n plus i sine two pi by n. So that cos two pi by n, I will write it as two into one pi by n, and i sine two into one pi by n. 
Similarly, alpha square was cos 4 pi by n. So cos 2 into 2 pi by n plus i sine 2 into 2 pi by n. Okay. If I continue till your nth term, uh, till your last root, it is cos 2n minus 1 pi by n plus i sine 2 into n minus 1 pi by n. Okay. This is equal to zero. And what is zero? Zero is a complex number, which is zero plus i zero. Isn't it? Now, if you're comparing two complex numbers, remember your comparison of complex numbers that your real part will be equal to the real part and imaginary part will be equal to the imaginary part. Now, what are the real parts in the left-hand side? Who will tell me? So you'll say the real parts are this, 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 Da, 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 till this. In short, the real part is summation. I'm just writing it in a notation format so that I don't have to write all of them. It is summation 2k pi by n from 0 to n minus 1. Correct? And what is the imaginary part? I into same thing, summation sine 2k pi by n from k equal to 0 to n minus 1. And this is 0 plus i0. Isn't it? So from here, it is very evident that summation of cos 2k pi by n summed from 0 to n minus 1, that will give us a 0. And same will be true for summation of sine 2k pi by n from 0 to n minus 1. Okay. So hence proved. Simple. Okay. And trust me, this result that you see, there has been Multiple question asked, not only in JE exam, but also in CET as well. So this concept is very well known. It's not like a hi-fi concept. Okay, don't just be scared by those summation symbols being used. <laughs> it's a very simple concept. It just says that if you have angles of the nature 2k pi by n, and you're summing those sine of those angles or cos of those angles from k equal to 0 to n minus 1, your result will be a 0. Okay. Now, what question has come on this? We will take one question. So first note this down and anything that you would like to ask, please do so. Okay, let's take a question. Can we take a question now? Okay, let's take this question. Find the value of this summation. Summation of, uh, they, they have actually kept it as a single term. So if you want, you can write it like this. Uh, you can write it as summation sine 2k pi or 2 pi k, whatever you want to say, 11 from k equal to 1 till uh, 10 minus i times summation cos 2 pi k by 11 from k equal to 1 to 10. Uh, Setu, sorry, I am reading your message right now. Uh, which slide do you want me to go back to? The previous one or the previous to previous one? Where did you get disconnect? <laughs> Never mind. I'll share the PDF uh, after the class. You can just have a look at it. Yes, please solve this question and give me a response in the chat box.
Okay, uh, Prishim. So I uh, I got an answer from Prishim so far. How about others? Okay, see here, you have been asked to evaluate these two summations, correct? Correct. Now we already know, sorry, we already know that if you sum up sine 2k pi by 11, okay, from 0 to 10, remember, n here is 11. So you have to sum from 0 to 10, n minus 1. This sum will be zero, right? But unfortunately, the question setter is asking me from one to ten. Okay, Prism. Note it down. I have noted down your correction. Now the question setter is asking you from one to ten. So simple, I'll break this summation as a uh, first term. I will write it uh, by putting k as zero manually. So that will give me sine zero. Something is wrong here. I can write this as sine zero and then summation one to 10. So instead of summing from zero to 10, zero term I wrote separately and then from one to 10. Okay. So this gives me zero again, because this is anyways summation from zero to 10 only. So sine zero is anyways a zero. So basically what I achieve here is, what I achieve here is, what I achieve here is, the fact that this summation is actually a zero. So this is a big zero. Correct? No? Now let us try to apply a similar approach to summation of cos 2 pi k by 11. This is also zero. Here also, if I break it up as first cos zero by, by literally putting zero in place of k and summing it up from 1 to 10. Okay, this should give me a 0. The cos 0 is actually a 1. So 1 for 1 plus summation from 1 to 10 cos 2k pi by 11 is a 0. So what does it mean? It means summation cos 2k pi by 11 from k equal to 1 till 10 is a negative 1. So this term here is actually a negative one. So your answer will be zero minus I negative one answer is of I only. This is your answer. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns with the solution? Please do let me know. Is that fine? Okay, let's move on to the next property. I think we had already taken proper two, uh, two properties we have taken. So let's start with the third one. So the third property, in fact, take it as a question. Okay, take it as a question. Let one alpha one alpha two till alpha n minus one be n nth roots of unity. Okay. Then 1 to the power p, alpha 1 to the power p, alpha 2 to the power p, dot, 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 till we reach alpha n minus 1 to the power p. Okay. Please prove that this is equal to 0 if p is not a multiple of n. And it is n if p is a multiple of n. Okay. Now, would you like to try this out or should I solve it? 
Remember, we had done a similar property for the cube root of unity as well. Okay, let, let me solve it. So in the interest of time. So left hand side, if you see these terms that you have, you can actually write it as one to the power p alpha to the power p alpha square to the power p alpha cube to the power p because internally, you know that they are in geometric progression. So knowing the fact that they're in GP itself helps you to solve many questions. So this is like solving the summation of this question, right? Now you already know it's a geometric progression. What is the sum of a geometric progression? A alpha to the power P is your common ratio minus one. Correct. So this becomes alpha to the power NP minus one by alpha to the power P minus one. Okay. Now remember here, if P is not a multiple of three, if P is not a multiple of, sorry, N, not three, N. <laughs> so we are not talking about N and its roots of unity. Then what will happen? Denominator will be non-zero, but numerator will be, this term will be alpha to the power NP. This will be still be a one, but alpha to the power P will not be a one. So entire sum that is your alpha to the power NP, alpha to the power NP minus one by alpha to the power P minus one will become one minus one. Okay. And that will be anyways a zero. Okay. But alpha, if alpha is a multiple of N, if alpha is a multiple of N, then as I told you, uh, using limits, you can basically answer this. So alpha to the power P will be one. And let's say alpha to the power P is some Y. Okay. So let alpha to the power P be Y. So this sum that you have, alpha to the power NP minus one by alpha to the power P minus one. You can evaluate it by writing it as Y to the power N minus one by Y minus one. And you have to take a limiting case of Y tending to one because you cannot, you cannot substitute Y equal to one. It will become undefined expression. So this is as per our limit result N one to the power N minus one, like the way we had done it in our case of cube roots of unity. So there you go. So please note that if P is a multiple of N, you'll get N. If P is not a multiple of N, you'll get a zero. Anything that you would like to uh, copy from here, do so. I will show you a very interesting property with respect to this limit thing. Is it done? All right. So property number four, if one alpha one, alpha two, da, 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 till alpha n minus one are n nth roots of unity, roots of unity, then prove that then prove that in fact, <laughs> prove that is because I want to give this as a question, but it's actually a property prove that one minus alpha one, one minus alpha two up till one minus alpha n minus one. This will give you an N. Okay. Now, how do I prove this? See, again, I told you uh, in the beginning also that we are trying to find out roots of this equation. That means we are trying to find out, we are trying to find out, or we are trying to say that the roots of this equation are your one alpha one alpha two, et cetera, till alpha n minus one. So n and th roots of unity are basically the roots of this equation, isn't it? So if this is the case, you would all agree with me that I can actually factorize it like this.
Yes or no? If one alpha one alpha two alpha three till alpha n minus one, they are all roots of this equation. Can I say that this polynomial could actually be factorized like this? Yes or no? Do you all agree with me or not? Correct. Now see, using this result, just let's bring z minus one to the denominator. Okay. Okay. So what I did, I brought the z minus one, that is the first factor, to the left side. Now, why am I doing all this thing? Is because if you see the structure of your expression here and the structure of your expression here will actually become the same now. Does the difference here is here there is a one and here is a z, right? The only difference is in the uh, required proof we have a one and in this given expression we have a z, right? So no problem. We'll take a limit of. We'll put z as one, right? But please note on the left side you have to take a limiting case because you can't put z as a one. Okay, so here you can put your uh, z as a one. That will not make any difference. Anyways, when you evaluate limit for such cases, it's a case of substitution only. So if you put your z as a one, it becomes one minus alpha one, one minus alpha two. This itself has been asked in several competitive exams. And this is n a to the power n minus one, which is actually a n. Hence proved. So you can see that one vertical of maths which comes from calculus is helping another vertical of maths which is basically coming from algebra. Okay, complex number is an algebra chapter. Correct. So you realize that a complex number chapter, algebra chapter, is taking assistance from a calculus chapter. So that is why we say in mathematics and in, in fact, in fact, all the science subjects, chapters are cross-linked. So if you don't understand one chapter well, you will make mistakes or you will not be able to utilize in the other chapter. Is this fine? Any questions? Any concerns? Okay. If you have understood this approach, let's take a question. You need to learn all those properties. Uh, uh, to be very frank with you, these properties will not be asked to you like a property. It will be asked to you like a question. So think as if you're solving a question rather than looking at a property. Okay. Even though I've included it in the in, as a properties of uh, n nth roots of unity, but there is high chances that these will become a question itself for you in the competitive exams. Okay, Setu. Don't look at it as properties. In fact, the next question which I am going to give you, it that is also a property, but I will give it as a question. Ah, uh, yeah. Let al one alpha one alpha two etc. till alpha n minus one are n nth roots of unity. Okay. And let me write it like this. One plus alpha one, one plus alpha two, till one plus alpha n minus one. This expression is uh, p when n is even, and this expression is q when n is odd. Okay. Find. Find. P and Q.
yes any success i think till this step everybody would have done it okay let's bring this z minus 1 down okay let me write it here itself i don't want to rewrite everything once again let me save my time and energy by putting this z minus 1 down okay now i want 1 plus alpha 1 1 plus alpha 2 so what z value will work over here think about it any suggested z value Minus one, right? Absolutely, Sethu. So if I put z as minus one, what will happen? The left hand side will become minus one to the power n minus one by minus two. Right side will become minus one minus alpha one minus one minus alpha two da 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 till minus one minus alpha n minus one, right? To be precise, the left hand side ex uh, right hand side expression is minus one to the power n minus one. If you take minus 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 common from all these terms. this is what you are going to see correct okay and let's say right side a uh, left side expression i have written now on the right side now here let's try to answer this question uh let me bring this term to the other side minus 1 so let me divide this term by 1 by minus 1 to the power n minus 1 okay now if your n is even what will happen what will happen to the left hand side left hand side will become now even means this is going to be 1 minus 1 0 0 by 2 0 again and divided by some 1 or minus 1 in fact it will be minus 1 only so that will be 0 but if n is even uh, sorry uh, when n is odd then what will happen the left hand side will become Minus one to the power odd number, which is minus two itself. So minus two by minus two, and this will become minus one to the power even, which is actually a one. So it's minus two by minus two only, and that is actually a one. So this number zero is your p, and this number one is your q. So this is your p, and this is your q. This itself has come as a question. Can you believe that? So this is actually a property. and this has come as a question because the question setter also knows that many students will not be remembering these properties so they have a chance to frame this as a question and ask is it fine okay so we will take a break right now on the other side of the break i will discuss with you a very interesting concept called the coney rotation formula so i think two concepts are left a uh, coney rotation formula i think three concepts are left coney rotation formula and uh, we have locus based questions and we have simple uh, complex number equations i think i should be able to finish it uh, by today's class so as of now let's take a break so now we are going to discuss something very uh, important and uh, interesting which is not there in your ncert syllabus uh, which is not there in your uh, ncert book of course it is there it is required for your j main and j advanced exams and this concept is called the coney rotation formula coney rotation formula many places you will find that they would just write it as a rotation theorem okay coney rotation formula or rotation theorem whatever you want to call it a rotation theorem okay. now what is this rotation theorem or what is this uh, coney rotation formula let's try to understand it uh let's say this is my argon plane okay this is my argon plane and on this argon plane i have three complex numbers let me make them a z1 and let's say we have um, you know z2 and let's say we have another one z3 okay so i've just taken three complex numbers on this argon plane where if you connect these complex numbers in this way this angle here is theta okay so what has been given you have been given uh, three complex numbers z1 z2 z3 and this angle here is mentioned to you as theta now there is an interesting formula called the coney rotation formula which helps you to relate these three complex numbers along with this theta okay so what is that relation let me write that down 
So that relation is Z3 minus Z1 by Z2 minus Z1 is equal to modulus of Z3 minus Z1 by modulus of Z2 minus Z1 e to the power i theta. Okay. Or you can write the same thing by reciprocating it like Z2 minus Z1 by Z3 minus Z1 is equal to modulus of Z2 minus Z1 by modulus of Z3 minus Z1 e to the power minus i theta. So this formula is what we call as the Coney rotation formula. Okay. Now, first of all, we'll derive this formula from where does this formula come, right? And then we'll see what is the way to remember it. Okay. Because it looks to be very complicated because many students ask me year after year, sir, this looks complicated. Can you tell me a way to remember it? So we'll discuss that also. And of course, we'll also see the application of Coney rotation formula. Now, from where does this formula actually come? Very simple. Let me make a simple construction over here. Let me just pull this back and uh, let me pull it back in such a way that it doesn't appear to pass through origin. Okay, let's say something like this. Okay, and I'll pull this back also. Okay, let's say I call this angle to be theta one and I call this angle to be theta two. And of course, this angle is theta itself. Let me just erase z1 from inside here it is coming in between the diagrams yeah so let's say this is theta okay first of all you would all agree with me when i say z3 minus z1 is a complex number correct when you subtract two complex numbers you get a complex number correct and let's say if i want to write it as a euler form can you tell me if i write it as a euler form Maybe I will put a five here so that you know you all can discuss. Can can you tell me what is going to be R and what is going to be five? So we'll say, sir, simple. R is going to be the distance between Z three Z one, which is nothing but which is nothing but modulus of Z three minus Z one. Correct. Right. And phi is nothing but the angle made by a vector. Starting from Z1 and going towards Z3, this vector, Z1, Z3 vector with the positive real Z axis and the positive real Z axis, the angle that it makes is theta 2. So this phi is actually a theta 2. Are you all convinced with these two? First of all, that means in short, I can write this as mod Z3 minus Z1 e to the power i theta 2. Let's call this as 1. So are you all convinced with the Euler notation of Z3 minus Z1? If you have any doubt, any concern, do let me know. Okay. No issues. Similarly, I can say Z2 minus Z1 is mod Z2 minus Z1 e to the power i theta 1. That means modulus is the distance between Z1 and Z2. That is your R and, and your argument will be the angle made by Z1, Z2 vector with the positive real Z axis, which is theta one as per the diagram. How did you get a fight? How did I get a fight? Now, uh, if you recall your last class session, the argument of a complex number Z1 minus Z2, let's say I make it on an argon plane. So this is Z1 and let's say this is Z2 or let me make it as Z2 here and Z1 here. So listen to this, everybody. I'll repeat this again. In fact, I had discussed this in the, the class when I was discussing with you subtraction of complex numbers. If you want to find the argument of Z, Z1 minus Z2, make a vector starting from Z2 to Z1. That means make a vector like this. Okay. What angle does this vector make with the real Z axis? Remember for that, I asked you a question where I gave you two vectors and I said, what is the angle between two vectors? And most of you replied it correctly. So what is the angle between the vector Z2, Z1 with the positive real Z axis? This is the angle, right? So this angle is what we call as the argument of Z1 minus Z2. Correct, Prisham? So in the same way, if I ask you, what is argument of Z3 minus Z1, you will make a vector from Z1 to Z3 and see what is the angle that it makes with the positive real Z axis, which is clearly theta two. So your five becomes theta two. Clear. 
Setu, is it clear to you as well? <clears throat> Setu? Clear? Nahin? You want one second to digest it? <laughs> Sir, very heavy statements you are throwing today. I will take some time to digest. <laughs> Me giving you is like you eating, but you understanding is like you digesting. <laughs> okay. So having digested this fact, let's do one divided by two. If you do one divided by two, you'll automatically get Z3. So divide the left-hand side expressions and divide the right-hand side expressions. And in right hand side, you will get e to the power i theta 2 minus theta 1, correct? Because when you divide this term by this term, as per your exponent loss, uh, the angles will get subtracted. Now, what is theta 2 minus theta 1? If you look at from the diagram, theta 2 minus theta 1 here will be your theta itself. Okay. So this term that you have over here, this term that you have over here, this I will replace it with theta only. And there you go. This is the Coney formula, which I had, you know, written on the top of the screen. Okay. Okay. So this is the proof of the Coney formula. Now the next, the other formula, which I wrote is just the reciprocal of this uh, result. That means if you reciprocate left side and right side terms, okay, of course, reciprocal of e to the power i theta will lead to e to the power minus i theta. And that is what is your second result. So any one of the result, if you uh, remember, in fact, I will tell you what is the difference between the two results. When do we use which one? Okay. So this is the proof for this formula. And then now I will tell you how to remember it also. Because the main challenge is, sir, I always get confused, uh, you know, whether it will be plus theta or minus theta. Okay. So I'll tell you a way to remember it. Just a trick. If in fact, I also follow the same trick. To remember this formula. <laughs> See, you will be given, you will be given three points. Okay. Let me name it in the same way as how I named the previous case. Okay. And you would be provided with an angle or you may be knowing an angle. Let's say this is a kind of a triangle, right? So you would be knowing one of the angles of the triangle or maybe knowing all the angles of a triangle. So let us say, let us say the question setter has provided me. He was kind enough to provide me this angle. Okay. Theta. Now, what is the way to remember this Coney formula? If you want to relate Z1, Z2, Z3 and Theta, in other words, in shorter word, if you want to write the Coney formula over here, you have to do you know, one simple activity first. This angle is without a direction. Give it a direction. Which direction will you like to give it? Normally the question setter is not going to give you any direction. He's just going to mention that that angle is theta. You need to give a direction to this angle. What direction will you like to give it? It is your call. Let me ask somebody, uh, Setu, what direction will you like to give it? Give some direction to this angle, clockwise and anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise. Okay. So Setu has given an anti-clockwise direction to this angle. Okay. So when he has given anti-clockwise direction, put an arrow on this particular side, just to show it's anti-clockwise. Correct. Now this arrow head is hitting a line connecting Z3 and Z1. Correct. And this whole scenario is as if like there is a rotation happening with Z1 as the pivot point, isn't it? It is appearing as if like there's a rotation happening, appearing. I'm just talking about appearance. So this is Z1 is like your pivot point. So write the two complex numbers, which you have connected to the arrow head of this angle, writing the pivot complex number as the second complex number like this. So Z3 minus Z1, Nico. correct? Z3 and Z1 are the two complex number, which are hitting this arrow head and Z1 is the pivot point. So write Z3 minus Z1 pivot should be always be the second one. Okay. Similarly divide it by the difference of the two complex numbers, which are there at the tail of the arrow, which is Z2 and Z1 
and again z1 will be the pivot point here so z1 will be the second convex number so i'm just telling you a trick to remember the formula trick to remember the formula now write the modulus of the same two things over here okay and now write e to the power i if you have taken your angle in a clockwise uh, anti clockwise manner then write a plus theta which is just a theta there you go this basically becomes your formula for the coni which is matching with whatever you have written over here okay now the very same diagram i will draw once again let's say somebody says sir if i choose clockwise then what will happen okay nothing will happen you will get the second formula i will get the other one of the formula okay so let's say this time for a change i take clockwise for this theta correct so arrow head first of all this is your pivot whichever is the whichever are the complex numbers which are connected to the arrow head of this particular angle write them first writing the pivot as the second complex number so i'll always write z2 minus z1 so pivot one should always come after the minus sign okay then the complex number connecting the tail of this angle so it's z3 minus z1 write down the modulus of both of them e to the power now see here you have taken in a clockwise manner this was anti clockwise this was anti clockwise so if you have taken in a clockwise manner you have to write minus i theta this gives you the second formula which i had given you on the top see they are both the same formula it's just that you are representing it in a different way right so both are same formula it's just there is another way of writing the same thing is it fine now you will remember this coni formula can we see an application of this formula now so this formula can be used to solve certain questions okay so we'll take uh, one of the questions i will not uh, spend too much time on this in fact in the dpp you can find lot of questions based on the same we don't need both of them we can solve with uh, with any one of them also okay let me show you a, a scenario first then you will understand that okay do we need to know both of them or See, it all depends upon what way you have chosen the, what way you have assigned the direction to theta. Okay, it is up to you which which how you want to write the formula. Let me just give you a problem. I mean, instead of talking in general, why not see a problem? Okay, problem say things will be clear. Okay, let's say this question. Don't worry, I will only solve it. You just have to see the application of the Coney formula. read this question carefully this question says complex number z1 z2 z3 are vertices of a triangle abc respectively which is a equilateral triangle you have to show that z1 square plus z2 square plus z3 square is equal to z1 z2 plus z2 z3 plus z3 z4 by the way this formula itself is an important property <laughs> as a serious je aspirant you should actually remember this also but again i am not asking you to remember things going beyond your you know remembering capacity <laughs> so basically it's an equilateral triangle and uh, these are the affixes of affixes means vertices okay so this is an equilateral triangle and these all angles are pi by 3 pi by 3 pi by 3 okay now the question setter has given me to prove this that means if z1 z2 z3 are the vertices of an equilateral triangle then this relation between z1 z2 z3 will always be true i have to prove this now okay so how will i prove it for this i will use my coni rotation formula so everybody please pay attention uh, let me drink some water first Ah okay, sir. Problem is difficult. You are drinking water and all. <laughs> no, no, it's easy. Now I will call any one of you to choose a vertex. Ah, uh, who will choose a vertex? Ah, uh, Noel, can you choose a vertex for me? Any one of the three vertices. 
vertices you can choose okay noel wants to choose vertex a so noel the vertex that you have chosen i will choose it as my pivot point okay so i will assume that the pivot point is z1 that means this angle pi by 3 is known to me okay now let me call somebody else mm, who should whom should i call kartik sanoj kartik can you assign a direction to this angle clockwise or anti clockwise it's up to you kartik sanoj give some direction to this angle see here i come to know that the student is not there on the seat <laughs> nidhi vijay give so, some so 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 clockwise i put in chapter also sir i'm kartik only no I, i didn't receive your message so it says from me to everyone yes sir clockwise then put it okay 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 kartik sorry so kartik is there so clockwise so kartik has chosen a clockwise direction like this right okay now everybody let us write down the cone at a so thinking a is my pivot point how do i write cone so remember the trick which i told you to remember the formula first write down the two complex numbers which are hitting the arrow head of this angle so that is z2 and z1 z1 being the pivot point you will write it after the minus sign okay then tail of the uh, uh, angle is hitting z3 and z1 and z1 being the pivot point you will write it like this and write the modulus of the same expression here now since kartik chose it to be clockwise you will write minus i pi by 3 correct so setu you had a question no ki which one to you so it is up to the person who has chosen the direction so kartik could have always chosen anti clockwise no issues right but what i am doing here is i am basically giving you a chance to take a call whatever call you take i will accordingly write the expression okay now let me name some other person um uh, let's name who nidhi vijay nidhi you are there z1 is already chosen and we have already written an expression now choose any any other pivot point or choose any other vertex so nidhi chooses chooses b that is z2 as the pivot point okay nidhi do one more favor this angle pi by 3 i hope you can see my cursor rotating on the diagram give some direction to that anti clockwise clockwise what do you want to choose anti clockwise okay so nidhi chooses anti clockwise direction for this now depending upon her choice we will write the cone formula so let's do that so the arrow head hits z1 and z2 and z2 being the pivot point this is how i will write it i hope this expression makes sense and since her direction of the angle was clockwise i will write i pi by 3 okay now two any two of the vertices i have chosen i have written a cone formula now from here i am going to derive my result how i will please pay attention first of all do you realize that this modulus and this modulus will be equal can i cancel this off you say sir how 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 are they equal see what does z2 minus z1 mod represent it represents the distance between z2 and z1 and what does mod z3 minus z1 represent it represents distance between z3 and z1 aren't they equal because there this is an equilateral triangle correct similarly this will also be cancelled off correct so can i write this now as okay and can i write this now as yes now i want to strike a relationship between z1 z2 z3 and i don't want this e to the power i pi by 3 etc to appear so can i do one thing can i multiply 1 and 2 Can I multiply one into just to get rid of that e to the power i? So when you multiply one into the left hand side terms, let's multiply. They will multiply, and these two will become a one. Okay. So can I write this as now? Let's take the 
denominator to the other side. See, numerators here will be uh, z1 minus z2 whole square with a minus sign. Denominator, if I multiply, let's see what happens. So this will become minus z1 square minus z2 square plus 2 z1 z2. This will become z3 square. This will become minus z1 z3 minus z2 z3 plus z1 z2. One of the z1 z2s will get cancelled off. I send the square terms to the other side and send the product of 2 to the reverse side. There you go. Proved. Okay. Now, how will this question come in competitive exam? They will say if Z1, Z2 are the FXs of an equilateral triangle, then which of the following relation will be correct? And you will find this relation to be sitting in one of your options. Okay. So whenever you realize that there is a situation arising where you have, uh, you can say three complex numbers or any kind, any number of complex numbers and an angle situation is basically getting created there. Okay. Then you can always try to use Coney there. Okay. Or it is recommended that you use Coney there to solve the purpose. Is it fine? Any question, any concerns? Now you can find more problems on in the DPP. Uh, okay. So I will not uh, take too much time because I have to complete this chapter today or today itself. I would love to take more questions, but unfortunately in the interest of time, I am just not taking any more questions. I will now go to the locus or geometry based problems on complex numbers or geometry based problems using complex numbers problem using complex numbers. This is a very important concept because in a J main and J advanced exam, in fact, in other competitive exam as well, Manipal and uh, VIT, etc., they use, they ask a lot of questions based on this locus or geometry based questions. Now there's nothing new to be taught here. Okay. Trust me, there is nothing new to be taught here. Whatever you know related to your geometrical interpretation of modulus, geometrical interpretation of argument, those all are sufficient to crack this kind of a problem. So uh, let me show you some taste of what kind of a problem will be asked based on geometry or locus using complex numbers. Let me give you a scenario. Let's, let's directly jump to a question. Okay. Let us say there are two fixed complex numbers. Okay. I'm just giving you uh, the complex numbers themselves. Let's say one of the complex numbers is three plus four. I another complex number is minus five plus six. I okay. Prove that prove that a complex number Z, which is equidistant. A complex number Z or prove that the locus of, of Z which is equidistant equidistant from 3 plus 4i and minus 5 plus 6i is given by i just write down the locus z 8 plus 2i plus z conjugate 8 minus 2i plus 36 equal to 0 so locus is not going to leave you. <laughs> so it was there in coordinate geometry. It has come back again in, in complex number. So locus is going to be there in complex number also because, because coordinate geometry and complex numbers go hand in hand because a complex number is like a point, right? So whatever is applicable to coordinate geometry, especially the concept of locus that can also be asked in, in your complex number chapter. Now I will only solve this question. Don't worry about it. You just have to watch. How do I solve this question? Just tell me a simple fact. If I call this as Z one, and if I call this as a Z two, how do you write this relation in modulus format? If I want to say the distance of Z from Z one is same as distance of Z from Z two in modulus language, how do you write it? Please type it on your chat box. If I want to show that distance of or distance between, between 
z and z1 is same as the distance between z and z2 how do you write this in the language of modulus that only you tell me after that i will manage from there beautiful setu absolutely so setu has said can i say this is equal to this do you all agree with him absolutely right correct and of course order doesn't matter you have written z1 minus z and z2 minus both are same thing okay now ideally speaking this is my locus equation correct ideally speaking my question is over here only but unfortunately the question setter which is me <laughs> i have given you to prove something which is slightly more complicated correct so what i want to do is basically write the same relation in terms of z and z conjugate so z conjugate has to come somewhere so if you want to introduce conjugate then kya karoge what will you do tell me correct please sunni correct what will you do you say sir simple i will square both sides correct why are we squaring both sides because when you square i can use the property that mod z square please recall this property mod z square is z z conjugate i can use this here correct so here i can say z minus z1 times z minus z1 conjugate will become z minus z2 z minus z2 conjugate just to bring the conjugate into picture by the way conjugate also has a property that you can split the conjugate between the two complex numbers which you have subtracted here okay let's multiply so if you multiply you will get z z conjugate by the way i could have written it as mod z square also but let's not you know go into that depth this will be uh, minus z1 conjugate z minus z1 z conjugate plus z1 z1 conjugate here also z z conjugate minus uh, minus z2 z conjugate minus z2 conjugate z plus z2 z2 conjugate okay so let's score off whatever we can score off and let's collect all the z terms together okay in fact let's collect it to the other side maybe let me take the left hand side to the right so let's take this term to the other side this term to the other side this term to the other side so it'll become uh, z z1 conjugate minus z2 conjugate then you will have minus z conjugate z1 minus z2 and i'll have mod z2 square minus mod z1 square equal to 0 correct me if i'm wrong correct me if i missed out any term okay now what was my z1 sorry i forgot what was my z1 z1 was 3 plus 4 i right okay so let's now use that so z1 is uh, 3 plus 4 i and z2 was minus 5 plus 6 i if i am not wrong was it minus 5 plus 6 i minus 5 plus 6 i yes so let's put it over here so when i do that z1 conjugate z1 conjugate will be what 3 minus 4 i minus z2 conjugate will be minus 5 minus 6 i similarly z1 will be 3 plus 4 i z2 will be minus of 5 plus 6 i z2 square z2 a modulus square will be 36 plus 25 which is 61 minus z1 square which is 25 let us simplify this if you simplify this you get 8 plus 2 i and this will become 8 minus 2 i and this will become 36 equal to 0 is this what we wanted to prove is this what we wanted to prove yes this is what we wanted to prove right so this is the you know question which can be asked to you see i have not taught you anything new here i have just given you the basic use of your geometrical understanding of modulus right are you getting my point so this is what we call as the locus based questions this is what we call as the locus based questions are you getting my point any question in the solution here anybody wants to know anything from the solution let me know if it is a multiple choice question you could have seen both this expression and the initial expression also in your options <laughs> so i can make a multiple uh, option correct question also from this sir why don't they give this as an option only see again 
the question setter wants you to test wants uh, you know uh, to test your overall understanding of the topic okay any question any concern here okay now i will give you some drawings to do okay let's let's do some drawings here since it is locus locus is a path drawing basically is very important for us so i'll give you some scenarios okay in terms of questions okay there is a complex number z1 and there is a complex number z2 these two are fixed complex numbers just like your 3 plus 4i and uh, 5 minus 6i whatever it was in the previous question so z1 z2 are fixed complex numbers okay there is a complex number z which is a moving complex number okay it's a moving point so as to say but it moves in such a way that it satisfies z satisfies this locus condition okay think and answer it's a very simple question so z satisfies the fact that modulus of z minus z1 plus modulus of z minus z2 is equal to modulus of z1 minus z2 can you draw the locus of z on this diagram can you complete this diagram and, and draw for me what is the path taken by z so that it always satisfies this locus equation in fact i know you cannot draw it on the chat box but at least you can tell me that this is what i am going to do to get the diagram i am waiting for your response read it very carefully the answer is hidden in this locus equation only only mid point ek hi point hoga setu socho socho think don't be in a hurry to answer <laughs> line completed it's not only through mid point <laughs> nahi nahi nah, you have gone off track now gali patri se utar chuki shalini line between z1 and z2 awesome shalini very very good okay see if you take z anywhere in between this kai bhi le lo you take here do you realize that this distance plus this distance is equal to this distance right and what is this distance this is mod z minus z1 what is this distance this is mod z minus z2 and what is this distance mod z1 minus z2 so isn't it like it's satisfying this locus condition right so the question setter can ask you this simple question also he can make a diagram and he'll say z is in the line segment connecting z1 z2 between z1 z2 which is the locus equation satisfied by z and one of the options will be this condition only <laughs> don't worry i'll give you one more chance to chalo now same diagram i'll draw once again so next question this is my z1 theek hai this is my z2 okay these two are fixed points these two are fixed points and now z is a moving point which satisfies mod z minus z1 minus mod z minus z2 is equal to mod z1 minus z2 chalo tell me where should z lie or draw the diagram for locus of z here tell me tell me if you are able to answer this i will understand your understanding of locus is very good on either side kisi bhi side i mean left right kahin bhi right side okay so setu is saying z can lie anywhere here i mean if you connect z1 and z2 and just extend z2 your z can lie anywhere here do you agree with him in fact i agree with him because here this distance is mod z1 z uh, mod of z minus z1 this distance is mod z minus z2 and the difference of these two distance is the distance between 
z1 minus z2 excellent okay now the very same scenario if i switch it like this now complete the diagram if your z satisfies z is a moving point okay and these two are fixed points so draw the diagram for this scenario tell me this time it will be ah absolutely so line connecting z1 z2 and uh, you know towards the other sides okay so please please note this they all are basically lying on the line connecting z1 z2 but depending upon which segment of the line they are uh, drawing this locus equation is changing so read the question carefully before you end up drawing or before uh, read the diagram carefully before you end up choosing your locus condition okay this can be a trick point okay now many people ask me sir this uh, locus based question is only having modulus or what argument uh, is not there argument is also there let me give you a question with argument okay <laughs> in fact this time i will give you a question and you have to draw the diagram okay in fact last time also we did the same thing sorry <laughs> let's say if i ask you there is a complex number z whose argument is always pi by 4 always okay so z is a moving point whose argument is always pi by 4 can you draw the diagram for z can you draw the locus draw the locus of z in fact when you draw it just convert it to english language and tell me what you have drawn <laughs> in short just tell me what what did you do to get the diagram i have already prepared the argon plane for you pitch is prepared time for you to all right setu awesome so setu is saying setu ka understanding clear ho gaya very good setu setu is saying sir it will lie on a line which is making 45 degrees here okay so z can lie anywhere on this line but mind you setu and others it cannot lie on the origin here that means yahan pe you need to put a hole sir ye hole dikhana padega kya yes you have to show that hole right why you have to show that hole because z cannot become origin because origin has undefined argument you can't say that even that origin is a part of your uh, locus diagram then you are fundamentally incorrect then you are saying argument of origin is pi by 4 but the reality is argument of origin is undefined so here you have to put a hole right so it's a line now see line full line is not required you can't go down if you go down your argument will become minus 3 pi by 4 So only in the first quadrant they just finish making forty five degrees, and that to origin you have to carve out by putting that hole. Got the point? Got the point? Okay. Acha. Let me let me test you with more questions. Okay. Um. Let let me give you an inequality question. Argument z is less than pi by four. In fact, okay, less than pi by four. Done? Is it done? See, argument of z is less than pi by four. Okay, so pi by four line is here. So your complex number will lie in such a way that your argument will be less than pi by 4 and please remember your argument will never be you know crossing the negative real z axis that means it can lie anywhere below this okay and of course below this axis also please note that and you have to draw this as a dotted line dotted line means it cannot touch that line okay now many people ask me sir why you have drawn this as dotted because it is less than not less than equal to so if you take any complex number in this zone 
वट एवर आई शेडेड एनी कॉम्प्लेक्स नंबर यू वुड रियलाइज दैट इट्स आर्ग्यूमेंट विल ऑलवेज बी लेस देन फाइव बाय फोर अंडरस्टूड एनी क्वेश्चन एनी क्वेश्चन ओके नाउ आई विल टेस्ट यू on a argument and modulus combined locus questions okay so as a test question test question please please try to solve this yeah question is draw the locus of draw the locus of z which satisfies So in the third and fourth quadrant will be less than five. In the third and the fourth quadrant, argument yeah. अरे यहाँ पे argument negative होता है ना? Sorry, I'm talking to Tejeshani. Tejeshani, the arguments here are negative, right? So won't it be less than five by four? Negative angles are less than five by four, isn't it? Your argument is between minus pi to pi always, right? Minus pi by pi, you talk about principal argument. No, so here your arguments will be negative. So negative angles are definitely less than pi by four. Okay, yeah. Okay, so there is a complex number which satisfies. There, there is a complex number which satisfies this condition. Uh, mod z is greater than two, and argument of argument of. Uh, Z is um, more than equal to pi by two. So, can you draw this diagram of a complex number which simultaneously satisfies this condition? I hear my dukan will be closed. <laughs> Done. Okay. First of all, mod z equal to two. How do you draw mod z equal to two? So this says that the complex number is such that the distance of z from origin is equal to two. So that will be a circle kind of a thing, isn't it? Like this, having a Radius of two, but greater than two means something outside it. Something outside it. Okay, and not including the circle. Not including the circle is shown by dotted circle. You have to make this dotted. Okay, so this is something which is the first locus condition. And I also want the complex number to have an argument greater than pi by two. Greater than pi by two is this zone. So I'll uh, shade it in blue color, maybe. Greater than pi by two will be this zone. Now your answer will be those region which simultaneously satisfy both these conditions. So which region simultaneously satisfy this condition? Only this part, because greater than pi by two is this part. now i will not go below this line because if i go below this line it will become a negative argument which will become lesser than pi by 2 so if i have to just draw the actual diagram without showing anything else okay my answer will be my answer will be everything which is in this part so your z can lie anywhere of course i cannot shade all the above up so everything in the third quadrant uh, sorry Second quadrant and outside the circle. Getting my point? 
Any questions, any concerns? Okay. Now I want to talk something about this guy also. Circle equations, circle equations in complex numbers. So if let's say you have a circle, I'm just uh, making a simple case. If I have a circle whose center is at some complex number and radius is R, then the locus condition that gets satisfied here, everybody would be, you know, now comfortable using this, the distance between Z and Z naught will always be R. So this itself is a equation of a circle equation of a circle with center at with center at Z naught and radius R. Okay. But you know what these examiners, <laughs> they, they want to complicate this expression. So there's another format of this equation. So what they will do is they will square both the sides. I yourself, why do they do this? See, they just want to test you from several, you know, perspectives. Okay. So the same equation, now I'm complicating it. If you expand it, it will become Z, Z conjugate minus Z conjugate Z minus Z naught Z conjugate plus mod Z square minus R square equal to zero. So this is another version of the very same equation. So this equation and this equations, they both are same things just written in a complicated manner. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you see this as the equation of a circle given to you. So there was a question, I think, uh, in one of the CT papers where they said that find the, so I'll just take an example of that question, find the center and radius of the circle mod z square minus 3 minus 4 i z minus 3 plus 4 i z conjugate minus minus 25 equal to 0. Please solve this question. Find the center and radius of this circle equation. Simple, your answer is already there on your screen. <laughs> you just have to compare these two. That's it. Compare Madi, your answer will be in front of you. Done. So it says, sir, simple. I will compare the coefficient of Z conjugate, which is minus Z naught. So here Z conjugate coefficient is this, correct? So if you compare minus Z naught with minus three plus four I, it basically gives you Z naught as three plus four I. So your center will be at three plus four I, or as a point, you can write it as a three comma four point as a point. Okay. What will be the radius? Very simple. You compare this term with minus 25. So mod Z naught square minus R square is minus 25 mod z naught square itself since z naught is this mod z naught square is itself 25 so that gives you r square as 50 so r is 5 root 2 so this becomes your r okay so such kind of simple questions can be also asked to you under this okay all right now a few interesting cases uh, please note this down if a question setter gives you instead of inequality, uh, sorry, instead of equality, he gives you an inequality. I think we have already discussed it. Uh, let's say he gives you greater than, uh, you know, equal to R. Then basically you have to shade the area or you are basically looking at outside this circle area. So everything outside this circle would be your required region. So your Z will lie outside the circle anywhere here. Okay. Whatever. If the question setter gives you something like this, less than equal to R means you have to consider the area within the circle. 
I mean, you are all smart enough to figure that out. But still, I'm giving this as a note to you so that you know you are. So within this circle, within this circle, the area will be considered. Okay. If the question setter gives you a, a scenario where he mentions that this is between some R one to R two. Okay. Then basically, you have to look at an annular region here. You have to look at an annular region here. where the small circle will have a small and big circle both will have a center at z not this is going to be r1 and this is going to be r2 okay so you are looking at this region okay so your z is satisfying the condition that its distance from z not is more than r1 but it is less than r2 so it has to be within this region so all all these type of questions can be framed many times they also frame questions involving something like this equal to some theta okay so in such cases please note in such cases please note one second Uh, guys give me a second yeah sorry so in such case what do we do we first locate the complex number z not okay and from z not make a ray in such a way that this angle is theta okay and punch a hole over here because z not cannot be included so you have to put a hole over here now many people say sir why is z not will not be included because if you put z as z not it will become argument zero is theta again you are trying to say argument of zero is theta but argument of zero is undefined okay <clears throat> so such kind of important situations can also be asked <clears throat> okay is it fine any uh, problem related to this locus based understanding so the last uh, concept that we have to talk about is how to solve a uh, complex number equations which is definitely going to be asked in your school exam also so uh, the last 10 minutes will be discussing about uh, sorry will be discussing about how to solve complex number equations can i go to the next slide anything that you would like to copy here ask here do so acha one more thing i would like to add here many people ask me this question see let's say if you get a question like this draw a complex number such that this is uh, let's say greater than pi by 4 let's say greater than equal to pi by 4 how do you draw this so very simple 1 plus i is like your z not okay so 1 plus i is like your 1 comma 1 correct now from here you have to mark that particular zone where your z should lie such that if you draw a vector from 1 comma 1 to that z point its argument should be more than pi by 4 of course more than pi by 4 and less than pi okay so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to i'm going to make an arrow coming from this oh sorry uh, at an angle of pi by 4 sorry so from here i'll make a angle of pi by 4 okay and i will go max till pi so i'll make a diagram like this okay so all the complex numbers all the complex numbers which will lie in this zone okay that will be my answer please note that you are not allowed to go below it if you go below it anyway let's say you take here then this complex number will have a negative argument please note that the angle that it will make will be negative angle this will be a negative angle so can't go below it okay 
so please ensure you are following these you know things while you are drawing the locus okay last but not the least part of our chapter is how to solve complex number equations actually this is very easy you will be given a complex number uh, equation there you have to follow this simple step replace your z with x plus i y okay and second step is compare the real parts and imaginary part from that equation in the equation so once you do this you will automatically be able to find your x and y the last question you did okay let, let me go back to that stage study see if somebody asks you this question draw the diagram of z or draw the locus of z where z satisfies argument z minus 1 plus i is pi by 4 okay then make pi by 4 and make a line parallel to this so that it shows you 90 degree so think as if your uh, origin has shifted to 1 comma 1 so now this line this line is your boundary line you cannot go below it right and this is your pi by 4 line so in short what i want to say is that this is your pi by 4 line and this is now your pi line so any complex number that satisfies this condition will always be in the shaded area it can't go below this line or it can't go towards the right of pi by 4 got it okay acha uh, one more thing uh, please note you have to put a hole here as well yeah this point should be a hole don't forget it why because if you are putting that point also in your locus or in your path means you are saying z could be 1 plus i also that means you are trying to say argument of 0 is greater than pi by 4 but argument of 0 is undefined no so there should be a hole over here please note this is a hole okay thank you tejasvini for bringing me back to that slide i think i had forgotten that now i will take a simple demonstration of this uh, you know and solve it solve a question for you from there the idea will be clear, clear. <clears throat> let's say i want to solve this equation find all complex numbers which satisfy this condition 2 mod z square plus z square minus 5 plus i root 3 is 0 okay so first of all take your z as x plus i y step number 1 okay substitute it over here mod z square will become x square plus y square z square itself will become x square minus y square plus i to x y minus 5 i root 3 equal to 0 instead of 0 write 0 plus i 0 okay 0 plus i 0 or 0 plus 0 right take all the real parts okay this is your real part together take your imaginary parts together i think imaginary part will only have this and compare it with 0 plus i 0 so compare the real with real imaginary with imaginary so this is your second step compare and imaginary in the equation so that will automatically give you two equations one is this and other is this now this all these two equations let's solve for x and y in these two equations so you have to solve for x and y so what i'm going to do yes sir any question you have setu kaise setu please tell me i y i y if you square it won't you get minus y square ha huh? you're talking like as if you are doing first class ओ अच्छा 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 सॉरी 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 यस करेक्ट करेक्ट या माय मिस्टेक अपॉलॉजीज ओके नाउ हियर लेट्स राइट वाई एज नेगेटिव रूट थ्री बाय टू एक्स एंड सब्सिट्यूट इट इन दिस इक्वेशन दैट्स द ओनली वे आई कैन यू नो यूज टू सॉल्व इट सो लेट्स डू दैट सो आई विल गेट थ्री एक्स स्क्वायर वाई स्क्वायर विल बी थ्री बाय फोर एक्स स्क्वायर ओके आई होप आई एम 
Yeah. So that will be 12 x to the power 4 minus 20 x square plus 3 equal to 0. I think this is factorizable as minus 18 x square minus 2 x square. Yeah, yeah, it's factorizable. So here I will take um, take 6 x square common, you'll get 2 x square minus 3. Take minus 1 common, 2 x square minus 3. So this will be 6 x square minus 1 and 2 x square minus 3 equal to 0. So this implies two things. This is 0 and this is 0 or, or and you can say. So from here, x is plus minus 1 by root 6. From here, x is plus minus root 3 by root 2. Correct. Now, once you've got your x, start finding your y. So let's put 1 by root 6 first. So y will become y is minus root 3 by minus root 3 by 2x. So root 6 will go up. So this will become, if I'm not mistaken, this will give you uh, minus root 18. Root 18 is 3 root 2. Correct? Root 18 by 2. So this is minus 3 by root 2. So one complex number that you will get is 1 by root 6 minus i 3 by root 2. And if I put x as minus 1 by root 6, y will become, I think, 3 by root 2. So other complex number which I'll get is, other complex number which I will get is, let me call it as z1, z2 will be minus 1 by root 6 plus i 3 by root 2. So that is one complex number as your answer. This is another complex number as your answer or as your, you can say the roots of that equation. And the other one will come by using this fact. So if your x is plus root 3 by root 2, y will become negative root 3 by 2 into root 3 by root 2. So that will give you minus 1 by root 2, correct? So your another complex number that will get formed here is root 3 by root 2 minus i 1 by root 2. And if you put x as negative root 3 by root 2, y will become 1 by root 2. So your another complex number that will be negative root 3 by negative root 2 plus i 1 by root 2. So four complex numbers will satisfy this equation. Altogether, four roots will come out. And I think after this step, uh, you should not need my help to solve this. So once you get your x and y, start framing x plus i y complex numbers from there and whatever complex numbers get formed they will be your they will be your answers is this fine any questions so with this we come to an end of this chapter next class i will be starting with uh, limits okay and i'll just do the limits required for your school stuff okay let's see how much we are able to complete in the next class Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.